Okay, so uh, my name is Lucas Fletcher, and uh, I'll be talking about the demonstration of a pilot skill leach bed and multi stage digester for treating dry lots waste. Because it was pretty tough for me not to jump in and, and answer your question earlier. Um, but uh, I've worked with uh, Dr. Chagall or under Dr. Chagall for this and at, uh, the, um, at Colorado State University. And, uh, you know, basically what I'm going to be talking about for the first part of this is kind of how this idea kind of came about, right? I mean, you, you, you heard the, Dr. Charvel's uh, presentation about uh, this, you know, understanding of the feasibility here in Colorado. Um, well, out of that, we kind of decided, okay, well, you know, maybe there's some better ways to do this. Maybe there's some ways to, to implement a system that would be able to answer some of these problems. And so we just kind of started thinking about how to do that. If we could come up with an ideal system, what would it look like? And so um, the, the first part of that, though, is to figure out what our problem is, right? I mean, we got to figure out what the problem is. And so so this is our this is our feedstock, right? And there's a, there's a place in Colorado you can go to, Mount Manure, and uh, the trucks actually drive up to the sides of the hill to dump the waste because uh, it's so big you can't drive straight up. Um, and uh, it used to be connected all the way over. So right now, in the elevation from where I'm standing, where I'm taking this picture, about 40 to 45 feet above the ground on top of this pile. And so you know, it, clearly there's a problem, right? Because we've got a lot of this waste. And um, and we've got many facilities as well. Uh, this is just a small picture of uh, Colorado, and just showing the number of facilities. And you can see uh, the, all different types of confined animal feeding operations um, here in Colorado. And uh, so, I mean, clearly, you know, there's, there's lots of places, there's lots of waste. Um, and, you know, to kind of show you one of our uh, sites in Colorado and kind of zoom in a little bit, what we see here is we've got a uh, we've got a dry lot collection facility. You can see the com, uh, composting down right at the bottom, and then we can, we've got over here uh, some lagoons. And so we've got water. You know, maybe we could do something. And this particular facility has a lot of other waste as well that could potentially be used, including food waste and others. And so, you know, how do we use some of these wastes um, to provide for this facility's very high uh, energy bills? And so, um, as we started looking at this, you know, what are some ways that we can kind of treat a variety of wastes and still be able to treat these kind of recalcitrant wastes that are a little bit tougher to treat. And so that's what uh, we're going to be focusing on. So uh, to kind of reiterate what's kind of been going on, um, we've heard this kind of again and again. If you look over, uh, we've got a variety of waste products, uh, various um, dairy and horse manure uh, combinations. And you see over on the right-hand side, they have fair production. So we, we have things here that have a good production in them. Um, but and it is variable, but uh, but you know there's still some you know promising data here that you know we could use. But the problem is the total solids. Uh, so as we look here, you know we've got total solids in the 50s, 80s. We've even collected it as high as 94 percent total solids. This stuff is incredibly, incredibly dry. And so we need to really think about how do we do this. And it does take conventional uh, or unconventional approaches because conventional approaches. Uh, just as a rule, don't, don't really work for this unless you have large wastewater uh, supplies that you can use. And so you see a complete mixed tank here, 5 to 10 percent total solids. You know, it's, it's not really going to work with a 94 percent summer collected waste. Um, but the complete mix has some very good advantages. Um, as many of you know, anaerobic digestion is a multiple phased process already. It, it has uh, has multiple bacteria groups that are working here, from the hydrolysis to the acidogenesis and the acetogenesis bacteria, and of course the methanogenesis that everyone talks about. And in a complete mix, they're in pretty good chem chemical equilibrium as long as you're putting the waste in, in the correct way. Uh, everything's going to be kept nice and mixed. And so as we started looking at things, we kind of started taking notes. Okay, okay, well, if we were to design a system, we would want it to have the advantages of each one of these unique parts of the system. We really want it to be kind of the best of all the worlds, right? And so we've, we've done our best to try to actualize that, uh, and we're still in a continual process of doing that. But as we go through here, we see that really it's, it's kind of found lacking. These systems that have been demonstrated and applied for uh, these very dry feedlot and dairy wastes. And so once again, you know, they really can't compare to these kinds of total solids. In fact, none of those digesters would work for these wastes that we uh, collected in Colorado. So what we've done is we've kind of thought, okay, 
let's let's go with the dry digestion system. We really like the leachate bay, and uh, because you can just take and it has really good solution transport. You're putting the water, and it flows right around the particles, so it removes the products from the hydrolysis process very easily. So the chem chemical equilibrium is kind of good with that. Um, and we really like the fixed film reactor, shown just two slides up, uh, which has a very you know it's, can break down. Uh, more soluble waste, admittedly, but break down waste very quickly, and uh, you have very fast throughput through it. And so um, those are really interesting. But what we realized is we needed another phase here, and we call it a buffering tank, or our, uh, you know we have a variety of names for it. And our the one we use in the um, in our coding in our pilot unit is the leachate storage tank, okay, because that's what it does. It just stores the leachate. And what it allows us to do is a, a variety of things. We can kind of do some neat things with that tank. Um, we can actually take and just simply store up the leachate. Instead of storing gas, we can store leachate. And then we can take the leachate and apply it to the fixed film reactor. And by slightly over-designing the fixed film reactor, we can begin operation in two to three hours and have full production um, in, the, in that period. So you put a start, basically you just have a non-continuous input of leachate into the fixed film reactor and that allows you to be able to turn out on and off your gas production to meet the end user's need. And so that's kind of nice if people are trying to get um, extra money for the peaking, uh, for producing uh, energy during the peaking requirements for the utility and things like that. Um, also allows us to be able to maintain really good process control, right? Because now we're not putting everything into the same tank. If we start seeing a drop in production of methane in one of our um, if one of the segments of the fixed film reactor, we just stop production. We just stop putting leachate in. And it allows us to be able to adjust a lot of things and keep it in a very stable place because we're using that second phase, the composite uh, tank or the leachate storage tank. And it allows us also to be able to really monitor the pH because that's such a big concern for the methanogenic reactor. And so, what would a full scale system look like? Well, this is just a block diagram of that. I'll show you more pictures later. But um, what we have here is a wastewater source. And uh, um, that could be anything. It could even be parlor wash water from a dairy or you know, a variety of uh, wastewaters or even rainwater collected off the lots. Um, and that water can be applied to the leachate bay reactor or it can go right into the fixed film uh, digester and be kind of used to dilute the incoming leachate if. Once again, the pH is a little bit off for us. Um, and then one of the important things to note here is that the leachate bays aren't all filled at the same time. They're filled whenever substrate's available. So whenever a uh, certain amount of substrate is available, um, one of the bays will stop production, be cleaned out, and then be filled again. And so that's kind of how that works. So let's say we have a 30-day retention time that we're trying to go for in the LBR, the leachate bay reactor. Then you know, we'll see about every seven days, we'll need to change out one of the bays. And so that allows us to have very staggered production of the leachate product. And so we won't ever have a very high concentration of um, any component at any one time because we have mature LBRs going at the same time as a fresh LBR. That had a lot of, um, there's a lot of little vagaries to that that really uh, lend itself well to this process. But um, due to the limitations of time, we won't go through that. And so, um, the system advantages, so just to go through a short list of those, reduce water requirements. Because we're not actually diluting the waste in the conventional sense, uh, we're just passing water through it. Um, it uses less water. Uh, waste as it comes out of the system can be around 40% total solids. So if you go load it, 40% uh, total solids is one of the ranges that we'd be looking at. Um, substrate flexibility uh, is really nice too. One thing I didn't mention, and you know, I may just pop back up there and talk about that for a second, is the fact that we have the ability to put solids into our leachate bay here, and then into the leachate storage tank, we can put slurries and operate that very similar to a upflow anaerobic sludge blanket. And so that's kind of finding the the uh, use for that. Uh, a digester that I had up above, and I said, right, we want the advantages and disadvantages, or we want to, you know, really capitalize on the advantages of each one of those. And so that could operate as a uh, upflow anaerobic sludge blanket, and you maintain a sludge blanket in there. And then solutions, like maybe just a milk processing water or a biodiesel waste, those could go directly into the fixed home digester. So we go solids, slurries, and solutions. We can split those up. And so, um, and there's some potential for reduced capital costs. I mean, it doesn't 
take a lot to realize that if you have a tank that holds 40% total solids, it's going to be a little bit smaller than a tank where it's only got 10% solids in it and the rest of it's water. Uh, um, also, you can think about other problems associated with building a tank like that and uh, the weight and other, other components to that. But uh, regardless, uh, we've got uh, the ability to control the process really well, right? Because we can stop leachate from being put in, we can start the process, we can heat the system different, and really we can optimize each part of the process according to the organism that's the main organism working in that area. So if we want to take and change the chemical or the um, physical characteristics of any one of the reactors, we can do that. And so we're on a kind of a quest to look at that. And then we have uh, uh, the ability to um, can control that process upset, and of course that's related to that. So as we see here, I just want to hit this really quick, but this is just so some uh, uh, gas production from a two-stage without the uh, um, buffering tank system, and we can see that uh, uh, it's still going up even at the conclusion of the process. And so it does have, um, we're still working on getting data from the pilot system, which I'll begin talking about now, but there's a lot of promise. So, Talking about validating this thing on a pilot scale. Uh, Osmer talked a little bit about it on the, the lab scale, some of our work on that. But uh, this is a, a demonstration in a research unit. It's a system validation on approximately 100 scale. So it's not really, this isn't what a full scale system would look like. Um, it provides uh, data on how we should scale it, how what it would look like. And then um, it has the ability to be self-powered and portable, so we can pull it to sites and actually test specific waste. This is often important when we talk to producers. They want to see it work. Yeah, you got this lab thing. Yeah, you know, we can go to your lab and look at it. But the fact that um, we can take it anywhere and be able to test it, that's a huge thing for producers when they can actually see it. They can hear the generator running on the gas, and they understand how this thing works. So it all starts here. Um, so you can see that LBR is actually um, right there, you see the white box there. It has wheels on it and you roll it out on the loading dock. And then a big loader came, comes and dumps it in the funnel on the top, dumps the manure. And then um, this is also where we empty it. And so it has a uh, floor which opens up and then we can dump right out of the floor uh, the, the waste material. And so um, for those of you that went on the tour, you got to see you know part of that. Um, and uh, this just is a way for us to load and unload the system and get the LBRs um, kind of managed and then we can roll them back into the system where most of the work happens. So you can see them right there at LBR. Uh, that's where they kind of rest. And then you can see the uh, right here is the gas storage. And so that's the gas storage from the process as well. Um, the, the rest, the other two stages happen basically right through that open door there. That's, that's where uh, those are operating. Um, and just as a side note about that, we oversized our uh, fixed film reactor in particular and also the uh, leachate storage because our main concern here is not about validating something that's already been validated, but about studying these leachate bay reactors and how they perform with the, with the animal waste. And so as that gas is stored in these floating drum uh, collection units, we then can take and burn it in the generator. So you can see the generator right here, just a depiction of it in the CAD document. But uh, then up in the right-hand corner, you can see the, the generator that we're actually using. And that's kind of the lifeblood of the system, especially when it's in portable mode, because it provides heat and it provides power. So to talk about a little bit about power, there's a lot of things that went into this system. But um, the generator takes the power and it provides it to our inverter, which is right here. The inverter then stores it so that whenever the um, generator is not running, we have power. And so that stores it in the batteries, and we use those batteries to go ahead and uh, um, provide 120 volt power through the inverter charger. And uh, you can see our the panel on the right hand side that uh, coiled up wires. That will uh, be changing in the coming weeks as we uh, build out those panels completely. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, basically we have a variety of safety and support equipment uh, in addition to all the required pumps and instrumentation as well. So uh, here's the two panels. Uh, uh, two of the seven panels, I should say, but um, this panel right there on the left will actually pop into that top panel that I just showed you, um, and it has a variety of things. We, we have a hundred, over a hundred things that we're turning on or off or monitoring, so there's a lot of equipment in this, uh, in this system that is uh, very, very important for us to not only monitor it, but 
we're not just running it. We're also optimizing the process and understanding how to um, further build out the system. So we have a little bit of extra controls in there to make sure the system is um, well understood, I guess. You can see here um, part of our, uh, our heating system. And so the generator also provides a lot of heating because we have a heating um, heating exchanger that's directly mounted on the uh, um, exhaust manifold of the generator. And so what we're doing is we're taking the uh, exhaust, cooling it down with our um, process, well, it's not actually process water, it's just a hydronic heating water, it's just a clean water solution. And it passes through these valves and into our tanks. Uh, you see here the uh, leachate storage tank and the water flows through those pipes as a heat exchanger and then flows back. What that means is it helps us to be able to not only cut down our electricity but it's also safer to have our reactor cavity just operating with water heating as opposed to some electrical forms of heating which could potentially form sparks. So we've had to also adhere to the fact that because it's a confined space and we are producing explosive gases there's a lot of safety concerns as well that we've re tried really hard to try to address as much as possible. And so you can see our uh, fixed film reactor right here. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see the insert that's actually inside the fixed film reactor. It looks a little weird, um, but uh, what it is, is it's just a, a baffled system to provide 10 different uh, sections, if you will, of the leachate bay reactor. And the water takes and moves over, under, over, under, over, under, and passes through that 10 system, 10 uh, section system, and then comes back. Inside there, we have media, small plastic media, where it's growing the bacteria. And in that way, we're able to uh, stick these tanks inside the system. The full-scale system would not look like this. Once again, we're using these tanks because they work well for, our portable, uh, for the portable nature of the system. Okay, so a little bit about the status of where we're at. Um, so... Uh, we just on Tuesday actually filled uh, one of our LBRs. We were out there with buckets as the tour bus showed up, uh, dumping it in. We didn't have the time to hook it up and show everyone what it would look like to have the leachate uh, flowing out of it. But um, but we'll begin uh, operation system after uh, about the next month. Uh, we need to inoculate our media within the fixed film reactor, and that's going to take a few weeks for the uh, methanogenic bacteria to grow in there. Um, and then we'll begin uh, as well, kind of simultaneously with that, uh, putting our panels in, our 120 volt panels in, and uh, our 12 volt panels, and getting the system kind of up and running um, in, in terms of the power generation and use and also the monitoring. Um, and then uh, we expect that the controls and the calibration of all of those controls, because they all need to be um, calibrated for the full system to be built out by uh, June of this year. And then uh, we should have some very good data about how to scale this system by August of 13, so August of this year. And uh, what that means is, you know, how, what is the production system? What would the economics look like? Uh, how big do we have to be able to, how big do we have to make this in order to, to make this a, a feasible operation? So I've talked a lot about the full-scale system. This is what one LDR of the full-scale system is at least slated to look like. And what we have here is uh, our tentative design, which is a, a precast concrete panel with, uh, it's called a concrete sandwich panel. Uh, that allows us to be able to put um, as concrete, and on the inside is uh, um, a layer of insulation, uh, foam insulation. And so, uh, and then we just use simple greenhouse covers. And for those of you from the ag world, you say, man, that looks pretty similar to a greenhouse, or even what we're really going for here, a silage pit, right? because it's very similar to that kind of an operation. You drive in, you dump the waste, you drive out. So what that allows you to do is it, uh, it's, I guess, a very easy to understand and a very easily um, handled system compared to other systems as far as the waste management is concerned for farmers. And so uh, this is just another picture of a full seal system with the doors. Um, of course, this would all be sealed. I should mention that I, the layer of plastic that comes down is not shown just for illustrative purposes, but um, but it would all be sealed and kept anaerobic during the entire period. So, and uh, if I were to actually point out the, the um, fixed film is on that side, you can't really see it, and over here is the, the uh, furthest to the right is actually in the leachate storage tank. So, so vision for future developments. This is kind of driven by the fact that we have a pretty great 
uh, flexibility in the substrates that we can do. And this is a tool that was developed at uh, CSU um, where basically you can just highlight a locality and uh, it'll tell you the production. And so we put in the right data, it's a GIS tool, it'll tell you basically how much production you'll get from this area if you were to collect and drive the waste in. And, um, of course, you can imagine um, doing economics with this kind of a tool would be pretty cool. So uh, that's, I mean, kind of where we're moving towards, putting in a full-scale system that can handle a variety of substrates and be very flexible with that. And in addition, reducing risk, uh, risk of failure. So anyway, so I'd like to acknowledge, uh, first of all, our, our funding agencies, and second of all, uh, people who worked on this project with me, Jesse Bergold, uh, um, Brian Grotz, and uh, James Hansen. So, and guess I'll entertain any questions. Any questions? So the the idea is to um, maintain your your VGA phase under anaerobic conditions. There are some ways that we could go into aerobic that would extend production during periods in which there's low feedstocks, and I could I could talk more about that. But um, basically through. Um, composting in the system and then using the organisms, the aerobic organisms that have access to more, more uh, carbon molecules such as lignin and others, um, using those organisms and their biomass that they generate to basically break those down. So we, then we'd go anaerobic and we'd break down all those aerobic organisms and then generate the leachate from that. So we wouldn't be generating it directly from the lignin but indirectly. So it would be, it would be possible at least. So um, we haven't tested that though. And is, how is it different than the dry stack and the rubric systems that are being reported in Europe now? Um, I guess we'd have to talk afterwards about which ones you're talking about. I'm not familiar with that terminology, but I am familiar with multiple technologies, including one that um, on paper looks very similar to ours. And their, their patent lawyers have talked to ours and all of that. Um, but uh, there, there are significant differences, and even with theirs. And so I, could, I might talk to you afterwards about that.